Broadcasting live, it's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America, bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Ben Crossman, and everyone out there, how you doing? Thank you so much for tuning in today. So today on the program, uh, we have a full hour of computer and technology news. And by the way, there are some huge stories uh, today. You know, often uh, we have very interesting stories and things like that. But some things have been happening with uh, with trade relations in China and the U.S. And if anyone out there is even remotely familiar, well, turns out that the Chinese and the U.S. are actually pretty linked when it comes to technology. So uh, we have one of the biggest players, someone who we've mentioned on the show before, is now uh, dealing with some really, really big issues. So we're going to talk about Huawei and all of that and a lot more. So everyone... Hey, stay tuned for uh, computer technology news. But before we get started, first things first, computeramerica.com. That's where you'll find everything for today's show. Be it, oh, I don't know, any uh, any kind of stories, any articles, any videos, anything that you need to know about today's show will be up on our website, computeramerica.com, after the program. Be sure to check that out, as well as our articles. And by the way, we have a couple of articles going up here soon. Uh, and just to give you a sneak peek at some of the articles that we are working on, uh, the first one is an article on classic World of Warcraft. Yes, the World of Warcraft from 14, 15 years ago uh, is being relaunched this summer. And yeah, we got into the beta and we're going to talk about first impressions, does it hold up, and so on and so forth. So we have an article about classic beta coming up here shortly. Uh, we also have one where, you know, we, uh, we got out of the house and actually left our computers. I know, sacrilege. But we also have an article coming up about cooking and eating impossible foods burgers. That's right, those meat uh, substitute that we have been talking about so often. Uh, we finally got some and we're going to post pictures and, you know, us uh, cooking it, eating it, and our reactions. So, hey, we wanted to give that a try. We've been talking about it for so, so long. And I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, to getting that review up as well. So, articles, reviews, everything like that, everyone uh, will, of course, uh, at our website. And again, hey, just thank you for tuning in. So, thank you for joining us here on Computer America. And why don't we go ahead and just get started with computer and technology news. And of course, it's brought to you by Computer America. Here we go. Okay, now I think our first story we're going to lead with probably the biggest story uh, of the day. And it has to do with Huawei. Now, we've talked about Huawei. Uh, we have an article up on our website. And this has been an ongoing, um, you know, kind of uh, an ongoing issue. 
with the United States and China, where Chinese com- where uh, the U.S. government and uh, U.S. companies they are strong arming Huawei out of the market, but at the same time, wherever there isn't a strong U.S. presence, Huawei seems to be able to find uh, uh, massive market share. You know, so. Obviously, if you're from the U.S., you probably haven't heard much of this company. But if you are anywhere outside of the U.S., uh, you this is a household name. They are almost the biggest phone manufacturer. They make a lot of chips. They make uh, a lot of the 5G infrastructure, radio antennas, and things like that that we're going to need to implement. And it's just a big question of um, you know, do you go with the cheapest? Or do you go with something much, much more expensive and will delay rollout across the entire United States? That's the question that's been coming to mind. And, well, looks like tensions have been ramped up to, I think, even a much greater degree. Because for those who didn't know, Huawei phones didn't run their own proprietary system. Uh, The operating system that they used was, of course, Android. And, well, hey, when your entire operating system is based off of Android... It's kind of inconvenient when Google, a U.S.-based company, responding to U.S. bans on Chinese telecoms. So, you know, just so you know that Google probably didn't want this uh, from the get-go. Uh, China, or, I'm sorry, uh, Google, just like many other companies, would rather continue to make money, uh, keep up their trade agreements, and just, you know, continue business as usual. But the United States imposed sanctions on, uh, well, uh, a ban on uh, U.S. companies providing software to Chinese companies. And here we are. Huawei confirms it has built its own operating system just in case U.S. tensions disrupt the use of Google's Android, which, by all accounts, it already has. Uh, Google has indeed pulled its license uh, from Huawei to use its systems. And, of course, that that includes, uh, you know, uh, Samsung's okay because Samsung is, of course, uh, a South Korean company. But any other Chinese company that uses uh, uses Android or a, or a derivation, uh, a derivative of Android, is also uh, uh, suddenly without an operating system. Just imagine if your phone in your hand just suddenly stopped working, bricked. Now imagine that for 1.3 billion people. Yeah, that's kind of where we're at. Now, and and of course, uh, Apple had to comply with the exact same thing, uh, because Apple is a U.S.-based company, and yeah, they had to, uh, they had to comply with this as well. So let's go ahead and get this article. Uh, we're going to try to get as much uh, context as we can. But this is, honestly, this is huge, huge news. So Huawei Technologies, as we know, the largest smartphone vendor in China, says it has developed its own operating system for both smartphones and computers, which can be used on its devices in the event that current operating systems provided by U.S. technology giants are no longer available. This is obviously not uh, not ideal. And, you know, uh, before we go any further into the article, just to make this clear, uh, let's say you have an Android device and everything about the Android device, uh, from the Google Play Store to everything that you have saved up in the cloud, uh, all of your settings, your just the entire operating, everything that makes your phone your phone suddenly gets disabled. That's what people woke up to today. So the Chinese company has been develop, has developed a proprietary OS as tensions between the company and the U.S. government could impact the availability of the U.S.-made operating systems used on Huawei devices. Uh, Huawei's mobile chief, Richard Yu Chen Dong, said in an interview with German publication uh, Die Welt, uh, Use comments confirm an early report saying that uh, it, which revealed the existence of a years long project to build an alternative to Google Android. And honestly, that uh, you know, that makes perfect sense for me. Uh, you don't want to put all of your eggs in one basket if you are making millions and millions and millions of devices. Hey, maybe you should at some point also be able to develop the uh, the operating system for them. 
Obviously, the easiest way to go was to uh, piggyback off of Google and to piggyback off of the Google Play Store and the App Store. And that's really what has led to such a huge adoption of the Android OS. But you should have a backup plan, uh, regardless if things work out or they don't. So, uh, continuing on here. Uh, they said that uh, Huawei started building its own operating system after a U.S. investigation into Huawei and ZTE Corp. in 2012, a person familiar with the matter reported. Uh, saying that, quote, we have prepared our own operating system if it turns out that we can no longer use Android. Uh, we'll, we will be ready and have our plan B. Uh, so the article continues, a previous U.S. ban on Chinese telecommunication, uh, I'm sorry, a previous U.S. ban on Chinese telecommunication equipment maker ZTE from using American products and services served as a reality check for China's technology ambition. Uh, Google's Android and Apple proprietary OS have a stronghold on the smartphone market. Accounts get this, and this is why this is huge. Uh, the fact that Google and Apple are U.S. based. Uh, Accounting for smartphone operating systems combined have a 99.9% .9 of the global markets, and that's according to Gartner. So when these come, so when a market suddenly says you're no longer allowed to use Google or Android, or I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Apple or Android, iOS or Android, that's pretty much it. You know, uh, it's not a monopoly, but it's a duopoly. It's not not a good place to be. Uh, although there have been a long line of developers and operating systems seeking to break the duopoly, uh, Microsoft with its mobile o uh, Microsoft, or I'm sorry, Windows Mobile OS, which did not do well. Uh, Samsung Electronics with its Tizen system, and Nokia's Symbian platform. Android and Apple iOS have a virtual duop duopoly today. So there have been some, you know, some trial and errors, and I think everyone remembers Windows, uh, especially for a company as large as Microsoft to try to come out with their own operating system. And I think like even at their best, even though they have a virtual monopoly on the PC market, a company even as powerful, as influential as Microsoft was only able to get like 3% at like their best. So it's... Um, this is really hard to do. Now, obviously, uh, having an alternative to OS uh, has likely taken added urgency uh, uh, for Huawei. Uh, through the escalating trade tensions between the US and China, Huawei, of course, the world's biggest telecommunication network equipment supplier, is also facing a string of charges from, U from the US, including the company stole trade secrets, violated economic sanctions, and concealed its Iran business dealings via an unofficial subsidiary. And, of course, Huawei has denied all of these charges. We've been over some of these. Uh, they definitely seem to have done business with Iran, even through sanctions. Uh, there are some, you know, some charges that are probably a little blown out of proportion by the U.S. government against Huawei's uh, chief technical officer. The point is, this is a huge rat's nest of trade negotiations and uh, sanctions and laws, and uh, it's just jockeying for who's going to be the best, uh, who, you know, who's going to be in the best position to capitalize on the world's technology needs. Now, here's the thing. Uh, they said that uh, Huawei currently the largest, uh, I'm sorry, Huawei currently the largest smartphone brand in China engaged in a fierce battle with Cupertino, California based Apple for a second spot in terms of global smartphone shipments, equips all smartphones with the popular Android operating system, which is owned by Google and its laptop products with Microsoft, or I should say Windows OS, which is a Microsoft product. That means that, yep, all their computers, all of their smartphones have to switch over to their plan B. Uh, meanwhile, uh, meanwhile, Huawei on March 7th announced that it had filed lawsuit in the U.S. against the country for its, uh, for its practices. And again, like this is just, uh, you know, talking about it's, it's, you know, what if it gets disrupted? Uh, that has come to pass. You know, this was published uh, uh, about a week ago and about yesterday. Uh, 
it actually went through. The the U.S. has banned China from using, or uh, I'm sorry, the U.S. has banned U.S.-based tech companies from providing technical services to China. It's such a big deal because obviously uh, China is that market that everyone wants to be able to capture. And uh, having a foothold in China, having a strong presence in China is such a huge, uh, important segment of the market for the likes of Intel, for the likes of uh, Google, of course, for Apple, really any tech company and really a lot of companies even outside the tech industry, they're now banned from supplying these things to China. So we don't know how long this is going to last. This is obviously a trade negotiation tactic. Like I said at the beginning, uh, a lot of these companies, uh, Intel, NVIDIA, you know, uh, Google, Apple, name, insert any tech company here, they would all love to keep selling and plying their wares in China. This is just a negotiation tactic. It's just a question of who blinks first. Is it going to be China? Is it going to be America? And it's hard to say, but I don't think anyone really wins when uh, these two giant intertwined economies start to kind of fight over, uh, fight with themselves. So there you have it. That's, I think, really the biggest story of the day. Again, if you're just joining us, uh, go back to the beginning and check that out. But the gist of it is that Huawei is now uh, banned from using U.S. products. That means that all those Chinese citizens who purchased all the apps through the, uh, through the Google Play Store suddenly have lost everything. So... I look forward to seeing how this works out because this really, really, really is a big deal. Okay, uh, let's. Oh, actually, let's uh, go ahead and kind of uh, you know piggyback the same kind of story, and you know uh, this one's of course adjacent to it. Google reportedly ends business with Huawei. Will cut it off from the Play Store, and this is again an update. This is a, a bit more recent. The article that we just did was uh, saying that they had a potential backup, and this one is saying that hey, it's actually come to pass. So Huawei sent a statement to R. Sekunka and others about the ban, saying that Huawei will continue to provide security updates and after-sales services for all existing Huawei and Honor smartphone and tablet products covering those that have been sold and are still in stock globally. Uh, Google issued only one terse, a terse one-liner saying that, quote, we are complying with the order and reviewing the implications on Twitter. That's right. So, yeah, they are, and, and essentially they're saying that they want to build a safe and sustainable uh, software ecosystem. Essentially, Huawei is pivoting away from Google. This is huge. Uh, this is this may not work, but uh, I'm certainly looking forward to see what happened here. So, meanwhile, other U.S. companies have started to cut off Huawei, with Bloomberg reporting that Intel, Qualcomm, Broadcom, and Xilinx have stopped supplying chips to Huawei. Intel is a big one, as it means that Huawei laptops are pretty much dead. Uh, Bloomberg also reports that Huawei apparently saw this ban coming and has stockpiled three months worth of chips from U.S. companies. So this isn't completely out of the blue, but uh, it's still not a very good thing. And I guess they're hoping that this takes less than three months. So to add to all the drama, Huawei has a smartphone launch scheduled for tomorrow where it will be launching its flagship Honor 20 smartphone uh, for its value-focused Honor brand. As of this writing, the launch will seem to have the go-ahead. So, and by the way, they, they even have uh, the original, you know, kind of story here that was the update to this whole mess, but uh, the original story, you know, kind of gets into... Uh, how many tech companies are going to cut Huawei off? And really, um, no one company is an island. Uh, Huawei definitely builds itself off of the processors that um, you know the Intel makes. It builds itself off of the software that Google makes. It's kind of taking pieces of everyone and everything. Uh, I think a lot of tech companies do exactly the same thing. You know, no one like Google or Apple, none of these can really stand alone when it comes to actually uh, building their products and supplying their services. 
And by the way, there's a lot more stories involving the trade dispute. I think we're going to go ahead and gloss over those, but you can see them kind of there off to the right on the screen if you're watching the video portion. Uh, things including Google reportedly ends business with Huawei. Uh, Trump uh, tries to shut down, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Trump tries to shut Huawei out of the U.S. market with executive order. So definitely uh, politics to play here. Uh, Bloomberg alleges Huawei routers and network gear are backdoored and the Nash and the uh, the NIH and the FBI accuse scientists in US of sending IP to China running shadow labs which we also heard about a couple of weeks ago. The point is this drama is not done but it certainly hit a new all-time high. Uh, not exciting in the way that you want it. So there you go. Uh, okay, so there's that article. Uh, point is, if you if you have a Huawei phone, uh, man, trouble ahead, trouble ahead. Okay, uh, there's that story. Let's go ahead and uh, let's talk about this one. So we like lightly touched on it. I'm not sure if we even covered it. Uh, it was on the docket on Friday, but, uh, you know, hey, it bears repeating because it is another big announcement and it looks like it wasn't just a big announcement to everyone out there consumer wise. It was a pretty big announcement for, uh, yeah, the people over at Sony PlayStation. If you're wondering what I'm talking about, here we go. Sony's deal with Microsoft blindsided its own PlayStation team. And when you think, oh, Sony, PlayStation, okay, Microsoft, Xbox, okay, now they're working together. Not not exactly the two divisions, but the fact that Microsoft is working with Sony to make a uh, to make an online or I, I should say, I'm sorry, a cloud gaming pact. Hey, this is uh, certainly a surprise. Although it shouldn't be a surprise to your own employees. Now, uh, they said that uh, perhaps no one was more shocked than the employees of Sony's PlayStation division who have spent almost two decades fighting the software giant in the $38 billion video game console market. Last week, the company announced a strategic partnership to co-develop the gaming, the game streaming technology and host some of the PlayStation online services on the Azure Cloud platform. Azure Cloud, if you didn't know, uh, much like Amazon Web Services, much like um, you know a lot of other hosting services, uh, is run by Microsoft. And when you think, well, who would PlayStation use to uh, you know for cloud gaming? It looks like the answer was naturally Microsoft. Uh, it comes, and they said that uh, it comes after PlayStation spent seven years developing its own cloud gaming offering with limited success. Very true. And I would say that really no one has perfected this kind of technology. So we heard from Google and what they're planning. Google is offering their own uh cloud gaming service that should be out here uh, by the end of the year but even they just don't have it completely under wraps the question is can microsoft and sony be able to co-develop and you know bring the audience with them to such a ubiquitous service now negotiations with microsoft began last year and were handled directly by sony senior management in tokyo largely without the involvement of the playstation unit according to people familiar with the matter staff gaming division were caught off guard by the news managers had to calm workers and assure them that the plans for the company uh, for the company's next generation console weren't affected asking not to be identified discussing private matters I guess it's kind of one of those scenes from, uh, you know, where just papers are flying, people are screaming, uh, things are going crazy. I guess that played out in the uh, in the Sony offices. So uh, they said that uh, that difficult moment is part of a painful lesson that Sony and many other technology companies are facing in the world's leading cloud computing providers become more powerful. If you aren't spending billions of dollars a year on data centers, servers, and network gear, you can't keep up. And that's really what we're seeing with uh, the next generation of tech companies. You know, uh, we may uh, have known about, you know, tech companies who built laptops, who built smartphones, who built tablets, uh, 
you know, they were the tech giants of our time when it came down to IBM, HP, Microsoft, Apple, uh, you know, Gateway, Dell, who made your computers? That Those were the juggernauts of technology. Now, it's about who can supply you with the data and the server bandwidth and the, the services that people demand through their smartphones, through their tablets, through their cars, through their, uh, you know, through connected cities. It's the people who can provide those data centers. And right now, the answer to that is none other than Amazon, Apple, Google, and Microsoft. Those are the big names in data providing. And, and I would even throw to a lesser extent in their uh, IBM as well. Those are the tech giants, and Sony is certainly not among them. So, hey, they strike a strategic partnership with who many see as their primary rival. Uh, faster in internet speeds are starting to allow games to be played remotely without the need for a local machine. That's a threat to PlayStation, which generates a third of Sony's profits. Microsoft's Xbox uh, faces a similar risk, but the software giant has a second largest cloud service, so it has a strategic answer. Uh, the others include Google and Amazon are building their own cloud gaming services. So I guess just, you know, the ability to make a machine and make a console that everyone out there will buy, I guess all these tech companies are looking at it and saying, that's not the model of the future. The model of the future is that you buy a super simple, cheap, effective console that won't be anywhere near the prices of the PlayStation 4 or Xbox One or anything like that. Uh, you know, I think gone are the days of the three, four, five hundred dollar console for now. Uh, obviously, there there will always be some kind of offering for that, but they want to provide their services beyond that so if you wanted to play your your ps uh, yeah your playstation exclusives on a computer i guess they want to be able to offer that because they know that hey the console is simply a computer and to try to uh, force these niches still it's just not a good strategy uh, they have a quote here saying that Sony feels threatened by this trend and the muddy Google and has decided to leave its network infrastructure built up to Microsoft. Uh, why would they sleep with the enemy unless they feel threatened? Saying that Sony jumped about 10% on Friday, the most in 18 months. Uh, the company also announced a record share buyback, but analysts pointed to his speed in responding to a shifting video game market as a positive factor. Saying this shows a new Sony. Management is adapting rapidly to change, which I couldn't agree more. And it's kind of weird because you'd think that, you know, Microsoft would have to be the one to uh, to adopt or shift rapidly. But it looks like Microsoft was in a better position for where the, the, the market was going. And Sony was kind of caught a little off guard, even though when it comes to the console wars, uh, PlayStation has been the undisputed winner of the console wars for the past four or five years. There's been no doubt about it, but looks like now it's, uh, you know, kind of coming back around. Uh, a Sony spokesperson confirmed that talks with Microsoft began last year, but declined to provide further detail. Uh, executives, including PlayStation head Jim Ryan, will update shareholders on strategy uh, at the company's annual investor day. So the article goes on for a bit here, but uh, I think we're going to uh, uh, kind of wrap this up. Actually, let's uh, go ahead and read uh, this last one saying that, quote, uh, well, I'm sorry, no quote, but regardless of when and if cloud gaming takes off, securing exclusive titles will continue to be critical for Sony, uh, according to Piers Harding Rolls. And they said that similar to how Netflix Inc. fights Prime Video while relying on Amazon for cloud hosting and how Apple Inc. competes against Samsung uh, while buying its components, Sony's core strategy of accumulating a strong lineup of games remains unchanged. So, yep, and yep, that's why he wraps it up by saying ex exclusive, I'm sorry, exclusive content remains key. I think those were some good uh, comparisons, you know, saying that obviously Netflix competes with Amazon Prime Video, but they pay for Amazon cloud hosting. Or Apple competes with Samsung with uh, their smartphones, but at the same time, 
Apple buys product from uh, from Samsung to build their own phones. Uh, just like with Huawei and the whole, you know, all U.S. companies are starting to cut ties. That's very damaging because so many companies, and it's not just damage. I, I, I want to make this clear. It's not that I have sympathy for Huawei. It's that it's damaging for all of those U.S. companies uh, that they can no longer tap into such a strong market as the Chinese market. Uh, I strictly think that's a negotiation tactic, and I am very curious to how that all shakes out. But all these companies are very interconnected, and now you have to add Sony and Microsoft to one of them. Even though they are on paper, in marketing, competing with one another, uh, they are now, well, hey, providing services to one another, which isn't a bad thing, not a bad thing at all. So everyone, uh, Computer Technology News continues on. Thank you for joining us, and hey, we'll be right back, more Computer America, right after this. Stay tuned. Greece is cheap. But the airfare costs a fortune. Paris? Not much closer. And again, airfare... What about Puerto Vallarta? Let's face it, flying anywhere is just too expensive. Wait, what's this? Low-cost airlines. With one call to low-cost airlines, you'll drastically slash your travel costs. We're talking insanely low airline prices to any of your favorite destinations. Where would you like to go? London, Rome, Costa Rica, Australia? Wow, that's cheap. So why wait? Call now to learn how crazy cheap it is to fly anywhere in the U.S. or international. Our prices are so low, we can't publish them. The only way to get them is to call to instantly hear the most amazing best deals on airlines travel. It's that easy. So call now and start packing. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. That's 800-215-4461. We are all Brother Wolf. Ten years ago, a group of locals banded together to create positive change. We took animals into our homes, held adoption events at local retailers, and talked to the community about our mission to help build a no-kill Asheville. A decade later, we have achieved so many victories for animals in need. There's been so much progress, yet there's still so much to do. As part of our year-long celebration, we encourage you to become a member of our special Compassionate Circle program. With a monthly donation of $10 or more, you will have behind-the-scenes access to the work we are doing at Brother Wolf. Our goal is to reach 1,000 members because we receive no government funding. Working together, we can help build and sustain no-kill communities. Learn more at CompassionateCircle.BWAR.org. We are a 501c3 tax-deductible organization. And welcome back to the Computer America Show. It is 30 minutes past the hour, and thank you for joining us. If you're just tuning in, uh, hey, thank you for checking out Computer America. And, of course, if you miss any part of today's program, you can go to wherever podcasts are heard, and you can listen to today's show, yesterday's show, every show in between. Hey, and, uh, yeah, you can, of course, uh, time shift us, take us on with, with you on your commute, and otherwise, hey, just enjoy Computer America on your schedule if you can't catch us here on the IRN network. Uh, okay, now, with that being said, everyone, thank you for continuing on. We're doing Computer and Technology News, and today, hey, I think our next story uh, uh, kind of touches on something that we've covered before, but I was interested because we just talked about Xbox, and I should say Microsoft and Sony. Hey, why not get a little bit of Xbox news in there as well? Uh, check this one out. Xbox chief outlines plans to curb toxic behavior, which make no mistake about it. Toxic behavior in the gaming community is a real thing and it's a problem. I see it myself firsthand. Uh, it's, it's very misogynistic. It's racist. It's homophobic. It's xenophobic. Uh, it's any other phobic you can think of. Uh, I'm not saying that everyone who participates in online gaming 
are these things. In fact, I think a lot of people who even say these things aren't them themselves in real life, but having that ability to speak to anyone and just say whatever you want with little to no recourse uh, brings out absolutely the worst in people. So I'm actually kind of curious to how Phil Spencer, who is the head of Xbox, plans on taking this on. And he said that he laid out some measures to combat some of the more negative aspects of, uh, I'm sorry, that pervade gaming communities, such as a, uh, such as toxicity and abuse. He wrote in a blog post that gaming is for everyone and people everywhere from all backgrounds and walks of life. They're welcome to play and welcome to all the fun and skill building that comes with gaming. Which I agree, that's how it should be, but not exactly how it is. Uh, as such, Spencer wrote, gaming must, must promote and protect the safety of all. It's essential that we embrace our role and take responsibility for creating so safe gaming. Building and protecting a healthy community is shared, essential work, he said, and he outlined a number of commitments to help, uh, you know, kind of work towards that goal. Yeah, easier said than done. Um, you, know, you can build the tools, you can have the, you know, you can have the guidelines, you can say what you want, but what's actually going to pop out the other end, that's kind of a crapshoot. So let's go ahead and get into it. Uh, Microsoft and the Xbox team will be vigilant, proactive, and swift in regards to potential abuse and misuse of the Xbox platform and will act to fix problems swiftly. I like that. They have updated the Xbox community standards, which we covered, to lay out how everyone should play a role in keeping gaming a safe environment and detail the repercussion for those who don't abide by the standards. Uh, the revamped standards spell out the difference between trash talk and harassment. And uh, yeah, hey, uh, it will help them identify future safety problems and solutions. I said that before when we covered this a week or two ago. Uh, as long as what is acceptable behavior and unacceptable behavior remains constant, fixed, and clear and concise, uh, I see no problem with that. Uh, because... As soon as someone says, oh, I was banned and I don't know why, and then you can very clearly point out and say, well, you said some language that was not very nice to certain groups of people. Uh, yeah, ban them. Ban them right away. Forget them. If, if they break the rules, uh, hey, they should be punished. Now, uh, from this summer, club community managers will have expanded moderation tools to ensure that, they are, that there are safe places for players to talk about games, additional content moderation features will route for all Xbox Live users by the end of the year, and they highlight that child and teen accounts can ha uh, can help parents and guardians protect their youngsters. Uh, yeah, so I think we're going to go ahead and you know kind of leave that there. Uh, one last point: moderation, user research, and data science, and other teams are already collaborating with existing partners saying, quote, we're, we're innovating now in these and other concrete ways to reduce, filter, and develop a shared understanding of toxic experiences, and to ultimately put our community of gamers and their parents and guardians in control of their own experiences. Uh, when it comes to Xbox, they were really one of the first communities to, uh, to have not just like text-based communication, because you know a lot of games have had that before, but um, but to have voice communication, we are finally to the point. Like we are 15, 20 years into this whole experiment. We're finally getting to the point where we have artificial intelligence to kind of tell us that, hey, uh, someone is spouting off some really horrible stuff in voice communications before you just had to kind of report them and say, you know, uh, they're saying really bad things over voice. Oh over voice comms, and if they got enough reports, then they would act on it, but otherwise they really couldn't check. We've seen this from Blizzard with uh, with you know Overwatch. They can actually monitor uh, in real time uh, words spoken by their players, and looks like Microsoft is working to implement something very similar this year and be able to do the exact same thing. So, 
you know, hey, uh, 15, 20 years of people being able to say whatever they want to each other and just be as horrible and mean and nasty as they possibly can, looks like that's coming to an end. And as much as I'm sure I'm going to get hate mail for censorship or, you know, being too PC or things like that, uh, and that's politically correct, not personal computer, uh, for being politically correct, you know, <sighs> get over it. There you go. Okay. There's the article, and again, just wanted to uh, go from Microsoft to Xbox because they were kind of related, but we have a lot more articles here that uh, are actually, you know, very, very important. Uh, let's talk about, real quick, uh, <laughs> this one seems easier, so we're going to go ahead and do this one. If you are over the age of, oh, I don't know, I'd say 30, 35, you might not know exactly what Jewel is. And I'm not talking about the singer, I'm talking about the vaping or the e-cigarette maker. Uh, Juul, uh, you know, and maybe you've seen all like news reports and things like that, it's pretty popular. Uh, the problem is, the only problem, and that's where this article comes in, is that it's unfortunately popular with the wrong demographics. And there's a reason for that, I'm hoping I'm hoping beyond hope that it's not Jules' intended consequence, but it's certainly something that they have to take into account. Check this out. This one from Reuters, and teens made up of uh, made up most of e-cigarette maker Jules' Twitter following, and that's from a study that analyzed well, hey, Jules, uh, Jules fans, and that's a problem because when over half of your well, half of your audience on something as big as Twitter or Facebook or some, or any other social media site, when half of your audience from Twitter can't legally purchase your product or legally use your product, uh, yeah, hey, you may have you may have a messaging problem. So again, this is from Reuters, uh, Lisa Lisa Rappaport talking about almost half of the people who followed Jewel Labs Inc. on Twitter last year were not old enough to legally purchase e-cigarettes in the United States. And that's according to a new study published today. Uh, researchers analyzed the data collected in April 2018 on public followers of Jewel's Twitter accounts with at least one public tweet. About 45% of those who followed Jewel were 13 to 17 years old. And, uh, and that's according to a study published online in JAMA Pediatrics. I'm sure it's J-A-M-A. -A. Pediatrics, only 19% of Jewel followers were at least 21. And these findings uh, from, more than, uh, from more than a year ago may not reflect what is happening on social media today. Uh, the study was not a controlled experiment designed to prove whether or not fo uh, the following... Uh, I'm sorry, whether or how following Juul directly impacts vaping habits, other research has linked teen vaping to an increased risk of smoking cigarettes. Uh, in a statement, Juul said it had questions about the study's methodology, which said that it, had, it differs significantly from data Twitter made available to the company. Uh, Juul has said that during the study time frame, it proactively, manually blocked underage users from following our Twitter feed. Obviously, that didn't work out too well. Uh, looks like still lots and lots of users not of legal age were still following Juul. Now, uh, the company said it conducted an analysis drawing from Twitter's backend data, which found that the uh, the ages of 13 to 17 made up only about 4% of followers in May 2018, saying that we do everything we can to prevent youth from engaging our company on Twitter. Here's the thing. Regardless of what they actually do, uh <laughs> Regardless of what they actually do uh, in terms of banning, even if they banned every single 13 to 17 year old who followed Jewel online, uh, and by the way, four percent still not a little, you know, still not a small segment, or it's you know comparatively small, but it's still a very very large segment for an age group that they say that they're trying to ban outright. So the fact that four percent of their total audience is still made up of that, eh means that they're either not doing it very well or they're not being very genuine. Now, here's the thing. If half 
of your new followers that you have to go in and manually ban uh, from following you. Uh, and you know, who knows what percentage of uh, you know accounts this actually is, but that means that there's still interest among 13 to 17 year olds. That means 13 to 17 year olds are still trying to follow you on social media. They're still trying to communicate you with as a co- with you as a company. Still trying to uh, see what the products are. You know, see what new products are coming out. What new flavors of of uh, you know, of liquids are out there, how to get one, uh, where they're available, what prices they are, if there are any sales or anything like that. The point is, teenagers still want to interact with Jewel, regardless of what Jewel is doing. And by the way, it's uh, the article makes very clear that uh, Marble, uh, I'm sorry, Mar Marlboro, there we go, the cigarette maker, uh, the group behind them bought a 35% stake in Jewel for $12.8 billion in December. That's right. Uh, so when we talk about E6s, uh, at this point, we're we're feeding into the same culture, the same company. Uh, yeah, it's it's the same thing as as regular cigarettes. Now, as of May 17, uh, yeah, as of May 17th, 14 U.S. states have raised the tobacco sale age to 21 along with at least 470 localities, according to the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. And, yeah, let's see if we can pick something else out here before we you know, kind of go, on, go online. Uh, online conversations about Juul were rarely about smoking cessation and focused on how to use and purchase Juul devices, which look kind of like a USB flash drive and vaporized flavored liquid containing nicotine. Admittedly, there are some that don't have any nicotine, and you can control if you have a high or low concentration of nicotine in these, uh, you know, kind of flavor packets. But you can be sure that, uh, yeah, it's just another way to get nicotine into the body, and it's certainly working for teens. Uh, when teens are exposed to tobacco marketing, they are more likely to have a positive affinity to the brand more favorable attitudes about tobacco use and greater perceptions that tobacco use is normative. And that's uh, from Triangle Park, North Carolina. And saying that last year, an estimated 3.8 million high school and middle school teens used e-cigarettes, which was up from 2.1 million in 2017. So 2018, 3.8, 2017, 2.1. That's a huge increase. That is well over a 50% increase. And it seems like from, you know, with all the work that the, uh, you know, that the anti-smoking, you know, don't get teens to smoke cigarettes and things like that, with all the work in public health that has gone into this, to see such a backward slide, uh, yeah, vaping is certainly, certainly seems to be a problem. So there you go. Uh, yeah. And, and by the way, just uh, one last thing here for everyone out there saying, well, vaping is harmless. Turns out, quote, uh, this is from a JAMA Pediatric Study. Uh, however, vaping is not harmless. Uh, LM said e-cigarettes have been found to contain harmful substances, including nicotine, metal light, metals like lead, and cancer-causing agents. So, admittedly, vaping is probably healthier for you than uh, than smoking cigarettes, but I'm sure a baseball bat to the shoulders is probably even more healthy than that. So, you know, hey... It's uh, choosing your evils, but don't smoke, kids. Now, uh, there's that article. Wanted to get that one out of the way. How about we talk about uh, Sony? Not Sony. I'm sorry. I saw Sony going through articles here. Uh, We'll just do this one real quick, and this is uh, pretty interesting. And they even have a comment from Intel, so I'm looking forward to this. Uh, This one from techpowerup.com. If you haven't heard of the publication, great publication. But check this one out. Uh, Intel tried to bribe a Dutch university to suppress knowledge of the MDS vulnerability. And the MDS uh, includes Meltdown and Spectre uh, vulnerabilities, which came out last year. They affected every Intel processor sold within the past 10 years. And it was a huge security vulnerability that led to a like a 10 to 15 to 30 percent Uh, performance decrease to actually fix it and you can bet a lot of processors out there did not actually patch so 
this was this this was as big and as bad of a story as Intel could pro, you know could possibly get. Now, here comes this one about the follow up. Cybersecurity researchers at the I'm not even going to try to say the University of Amsterdam uh, alleged that Intel tried to bribe them to suppress knowledge of the latest processor vulner uh, I'm sorry security vulnerability rogue in flight data load, which the company made public on May 14th. A uh, Dutch publication, uh, which I'm not going to try that either, reports that Intel offered to pay the researchers about forty thousand dollars to reward uh, as a reward to allegedly get them to downplay the severity and vulnerability and back their offer with an additional eighty thousand dollars. So a combined one hundred and twenty thousand dollars, which the team politely refused. Hmm. Now. Uh, Intel's security vulnerability bounty program is shrouded in CYA agreements uh, designed to minimize Intel's losses from the discovery of new vulnerabilities. Under its terms, once a discoverer accepts the bounty reward, they enter into a non-disclosure agreement with Intel to not disclose their foundings or communicate with, uh, with regards to any other person or entity uh, other than a certain authorized people at Intel. And we've seen this before. It's kind of okay. Like it, it should be that way to a certain extent, and we're going to talk about that. But uh, this article is almost over, so we're going to talk about that, and then we'll uh, finish up with uh, with my comments. But with public knowledge withheld, Intel can work on mitigation and patches against the vulnerability. Intel argues that the information of vulnerabilities becoming public before it's had a chance to address them would give the bad guys time to design and spread malware that exploits the vulnerability. This is an argument that the people at VU weren't willing to buy, and thus Intel is forced to disclose RIDL, which is, again, the uh, the rogue in-flight data load vulnerability as a microcode update. Software update and patched hardware are only beginning to come out. And by the way, they have an update. Uh, yeah, they have an update because this article was a couple of days ago, and they have an update uh about the same day, Intel contacted us with a statement on the story pertaining to the terms of its bug bounty program saying, quote, we, Intel, believe that working with skilled security researchers across the globe is a crucial part of identifying and mitigating security vulnerabilities. One of the ways that we engage with researchers is through our bug bounty program. We provide a clear overview of our bug bounty program requirements and award schedule on our websites, which they have a link to which we'll go ahead and throw up on the uh, video portion, which you can see right here. Uh, the point is, I'm kind of okay with the NDAs, the you know the non-disclosure agreements uh, to a certain extent. I feel like if you can talk to Intel or you can talk to any other company out there that you may have a bug bounty claim with, uh, they should have a certain amount of lead time. I'm not saying that, hey, we need two years to fix this. No, in two years, uh, the news will be gone, uh, technology will have moved on, and it would no longer be useful. That's essentially just buying people silence. But if they need a week, if they need two weeks, if it's a huge security flaw like this where any Intel processor could have the data that's streaming through it compromised, uh, you know, give them a week, give them two weeks, maybe even as much as a month. However much time the security researchers really feel like they need to get a good, accurate, you know, kind of uh, security fix for this and then release the findings. Uh, you should know about how these things are compromised so that security researchers in the future can look for similar compromises or uh, if people are designing hardware, they can design around this and they know how to avoid these pitfalls. Uh, this information should definitely always be made publicly available as soon as possible. But again, I also think that these company uh, that these companies should have uh, some kind of some kind of uh, time to go ahead and fix them before everyone knows about them. Uh, we saw the same thing with uh, with Google and and their Google Plus fiasco. Turns out, you know, that's still not enough to save products sometimes. But I think everyone deserves kind of that chance to fix 
to fix the errors before they become public knowledge. So there you go. Uh, yeah, just this uh, this whole security uh, this whole security thing with uh, with Intel and its processors seems to be getting worse and worse. But uh, this one, yeah, I don't think it was so much a bribe as it was, hey, give us some time to uh, you know to work on this. So there you go. Okay, everyone, uh, we have time for just one more story, and I know just the one I want to do, although we have a lot of very, very cool stories that I wanted to uh, to get to, but I feel like this is probably the second biggest when it comes to economics and trade and, you know, uh, maybe, maybe money shifting hands and things like that. This is probably the second biggest story of the day, and I kind of regret, I kind of regret waiting until the end, but check this one out. T-Mobile and Sprint make promises to clinch the FCC's merger approval. And by the way, if you didn't know, I think as of today, and this article from, from John Fingus and, and Gadget, I think as of today, T-Mobile and Sprint uh, actually got approval from the FCC. Uh, saying that T-Mobile and Sprint are still determined to secure a merger, and they've made a fresh round of promises to win regulators' hearts. The carriers have made new commitments to the FCC that would guarantee wider access to high-speed internet, and by the way, high-speed mobile internet, I should say, and home broadband, not to mention address concerns about a lack of competition. They vowed to deploy 5G services that cover 97% of the U.S. population within three years and 99% of, in, I'm sorry, within six years. About 90% of Americans would have mobile internet speeds of at least 100 megabytes per second, where 99% would have above 50 megabytes per second or more. And again, all of this mobile internet speeds. Uh, rural broadband would also play a role, saying that 5G would cover 85% of rural Americans in three years and 90% in six years. Two-thirds of rural dwellers would have mid-band 5G. There are also specific commitments to launching in-home internet access. Hmm. Uh, so to address the, the competition concerns, the two would divest one of Sprint's prepaid brands, Boost Mobile. So it looks like Boost Mobile, and Boost Mobile was, of course, uh, part of Sprint. It looks like there's a possibility that Sprint is willing to cut off the arm that is Boost Mobile so that they can continue on with uh, with this merger. Eh, I don't know if that really you know assuages a lot of uh, fears of competition. Now, uh, FCC Chairman Ajit Pai believed that the promises made were enough to... Uh, to make the merger in the public interest and said that he would recommend that the FCC commissioners approve the deal. It's a rare chance to accelerate the, the deployment of 5G and rural broadband, he said. You'll have to wait a while to find out whether or not the rest of the FCC approves, though. Pi is only presenting his fellow officials with the draft order in the coming weeks, and its, uh, its success depends on the majority of commissioners voting in favor. Uh, that's not including the concerns with the Department of Justice. Even so, this might hearten news for T-Mobile and Sprint after months of uncertainty. I, I, and again, this is big news because obviously we're going from four major carriers, uh, Verizon, AT&T, Sprint, and T-Mobile, and they said that T-Mobile and Sprint, who are in positions three and four, they're having a hard time keeping up with uh, with AT&T and Sprint or uh, I'm sorry with AT&T and Verizon they're saying that if they were allowed to merge uh, if two uh, there we go if two of the remaining four companies are allowed to merge into a singular company uh, they could better provide competition to the others it's hard for me as a consumer and someone who follows technology on a daily basis, it's hard for someone like me to look at this and go, you know, people are going to have more competition by having less companies providing that competition. By going from, and by the way, I, th I think four companies uh, providing networks to which you can take your cell phone and, you know, have a data plan with or any kind of cell phone plan with, I think four was abysmal. Uh 
you know, of course you have things that are coming up like Cricket, Mobile, and, you know, uh, some other, you know, kind of little options. But even those are just, uh, they just piggyback on Verizon and AT&T uh, uh, networks. They're not actually true competition themselves. They're just kind of a front end for some of these other companies. Uh, it's it's a false sense of competition. So when they say that it's in the public's best interest that uh, you know you have three choices instead of two choices, I find that super hard to believe. So I'm not hopeful. You know, if I had to play, you know, if I had to give my best guess, I would still not be hopeful. I understand that they're trying to do this. And by the way, one of the big things here is the rollout of 5G and the accelerated rollout of 5G and adoption of 5G internet. Uh, that was going to happen anyways. If you recall what happened with 4G and 4G LTE, as soon as there's a new standard that comes onto the market and they say, hey, uh, you can have a phone with 4G or 4G LTE and the commercials start pumping, uh, the brand awareness starts to rise and say that, hey, uh, at and has the best 4G LTE network or whatever. Uh, that is a self-fulfilling prophecy that consumers will demand. And hey, if you are in this market, you will have to meet that demand. So the 5G was going to happen anyways, even faster than I think uh, Veri even faster than T-Mobile One Sprint were going to promise. So I don't really count that as a concession because that was probably going to happen anyways. But everyone, now the music means that we're done. Thank you so much for tuning into Computer America. If again, if you miss the show, check out our podcast wherever podcasts are heard. Search Computer America, and you can check us out there. In the meantime, catch us tomorrow. We have a great interview. Let me get this right from our paperwork. Tomorrow we have a great interview with Counterpoints Research. That's right. And uh, we'll be talking all about smartphone market and vulnerabilities and things like that. It's going to be great. So everyone, uh, stay tuned. More Computer America tomorrow, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern. Catch you then. Bye, everyone.